Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Emily Eliza Scott, an assistant professor of art history and environmental studies at the University of Oregon. Scott's interests focus on art and the public sphere, critical approaches to the built environment, visual cultures of nature, and social and environmental justice. Prior to joining the UO faculty in fall 2018, Scott was a visiting professor at Free University Amsterdam and a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for the History and Theory of Architecture at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Scott's first book, Critical Landscapes, Art, Space, Politics, co-edited with Kirsten Svensson, was published by the University of California Press in 2018. Thanks, Emily, for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. So tell us a bit about your background and your trajectory because it's an unusual one for an art historian. That's very true. Um, so there are a couple of things that I would say are unusual about my trajectory. Um, first, that I'll, first is that I've been very interdisciplinary, kind of thoroughly interdisciplinary to the extent that I've sort of studied in and um, held positions in and published in multiple fields, namely, uh, art history, contemporary art history, uh, and environmental studies, environmental humanities, geography, and architecture. So my work for a long time has been at the intersection of those fields, but I think it's a little bit unusual that I would, for instance, have now you know, gotten a PhD in art history, then worked in an architecture department for six years, and now have a joint position in art history and environmental studies, which I'm really thrilled to have. It's a very unique position. Uh, I think it's safe to say it's the first of its kind mm -hmm. that's bringing those two fields together. <laughs> and it really is sort of the perfect dream fit for me. So I'm really thrilled about um, having this new position at the University of Oregon. Uh, the other thing that's unusual about my trajectory is after I finished my undergraduate degree, I worked for the National Park Service for 10 years as a park ranger, which would seem a diversion from studying art history, which I had also studied as an undergrad, and then went on to start my graduate work you know, roughly 10 years later with that interim being working as a ranger. Um, in fact, um, the park ranger experience is pretty integral to my kind of intellectual trajectory and mm. my kind of um, scholarly practice and creative practice since and in ways that I'm still kind of figuring out or sometimes you know the revelation about the extent to which that experience kind of formed me um, is still revealing itself so content wise I'm still very interested in visual cultures of nature in the politics and history of nature in um, very much also in the way that nature is framed and defined by institutions, including the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a way in which the, the um, method for learning about parks, as I was kind of a, an interpreter, a lay naturalist, I, I don't have a background in natural resource management or in biology, as many rangers do not, some do, some of us you know, don't. But as an interpreter, my job was really to just kind of learn a place and learn how to tell stories about a place and learn about the complexity of a place and to help facilitate people's kind of connections with that place. And so there's a form of site-specific knowledge that's really demanded of the ranger. And I've gone on in my kind of scholarly art historical studies to really focus on site-specific art practices. So there's a link there that maybe isn't so obvious at the beginning. And um, if I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it, but I've also done some work with art collectives, more mm -hmm. as a practicing kind of site-specific artist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the ranger experience was very central and continues to kind of influence my thinking and my, my methodology in some ways. Where were you a ranger? What state? I was a ranger at Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska and uh, in Utah at Canyonlands and Arches for many years. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so desert and kind of glacial landscape. Um, the other um, thing I would say about the Park Service is that at some point it became clear to me that I needed to leave the Park Service and um, sort of go back to academia because the kinds of questions I was most excited about were not necessarily the questions that the people around me were asking, mm -hmm. which were more, you could say, theoretical questions, uh, more politicized questions, questions that had to do with the kind of meta level of, again, thinking about how nature is produced, thinking about um, how nature is represented. And so I developed a couple kind of strange ranger programs when I was a ranger. 
Um, one was on um, in, in Canyonlands that was, I'm going to forget the title of this campfire program, but it was, oh, it was Canyonlands, or Canyon Country Through the Hollywood Lens. Hmm. And I once had a, a fellow uh, in the audience come up afterwards, and he said, you know, your program was very, like, sort of postmodern or <laughs> theoretical. What's your background? And he turned out to be the curator of a, like, very prominent photography museum. So he sort of pegged me as like having mm. these more theoretical interests, but of course I had to really um, mask them and translate them into a way that was very graspable and accessible to, you know, everyone from little kids to, um, you know, senior citizens of the whole, acrossing the political spectrum and, you know, tourists from all over the world. So um, I think as it's really helped me in my teaching too, mm -hmm. my years in doing interpretation, That's learning right. how to be a kind of accessible, engaging speaker. Yeah. So um, as a way of sort of um, thinking more about how that got you to what you do now mm -hmm. um, and, and the way in which your interest in representations of the land and representations of nature g get articulated in your scholarly work, um, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the co-edited volume you did mm -hmm. with Kirsten Svensson, Critical Landscapes, Art, Space, and Politics. So first, can you give us a sense of what the aim of that project, of that collection is? What what are you trying to get at there? What does it mean to have to be talking about critical landscapes? Yeah, that's a good question. There was a lot of debate about the title from really the beginning of the proposal all the way up until the last minute. Um, we struggled a little bit with that word critical. Um, Partly um, because I think a lot of the artists in the book that are represented, and there's some also kind of experimental geographers, experimental architectural kind of practitioners in the book, but it's primarily, you know, artists. Um, a lot of them are sort of working in ways that move beyond critique alone. Mm -hmm. They're sort of um, imagining sort of other scenarios or they're making proposals for kind of different um, ways of interacting with land. So it's not only you know, critique. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of limit or problem of that word. What we liked about the word critical is it's tied to the word crisis. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work in the book is really artists who are taking up like very kind of difficult, contentious issues and sites in their work and, um, you know, sort of engaging in many cases with, you know, sort of um, struggles around social justice or environmental justice mm -hmm. through site based practices and ones that engage land specifically. So that was kind of an anchor that held the project together. Um, it's very international in scope. It's fairly interdisciplinary. Um, we tried to um, kind of diversify this set of projects represented in the book by having in addition to, I think it's 10 or 11 full length kind of scholarly essays, we selected a group of 25 or 30 artworks that we thought were really kind of exemplary mm -hmm. of the moment, mm -hmm. of the contemporary moment and of contemporary landscape and the kind of crises of landscape or landscapes and crises. And then we kind of commissioned um, 25 authors to do these very short entries that are interspersed throughout. So it was a little bit like a curatorial project. About those artworks. About specific artworks. Mm -hmm. and in some cases, the artists themselves wrote about their artworks. Some artists are very good writers and mm -hmm. they're very capable and they're, you know, do kind of critical writing themselves. Mm -hmm. In other cases, we sort of brought a, a lens of someone else to a work. So um, in one instance, this very, very interesting, um, uh, I guess we would call her a critical, she's hard, it's hard to describe what she is. Um, Laura Kurgan, who she runs the Center for Spatial Research mm -hmm. um, at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. She comes from architecture, but she did a really um, important project looking at the prison industrial complex that involved a lot of kind of mappings of looking at the geography of people who come from and end up going back and cycling through the prison industrial complex and its connection to racism mm -hmm. and classism. Mm -hmm. And so it's a complex project. So there were two geographers that we sort of brought in who themselves have collaborated and written a lot about borders and prisons to speak about her work. So we really wanted to kind of have a very, like a, a wide array of perspectives and practices in the book. Yeah. So, so I know from reading <clears throat> the introduction to the book that one of the things you're interested in is to interrogate settled ideas about landscape or yeah. to use a more technical term to um, denaturalize landscape. So. Mm -hmm. Why, what, is, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. And why is that a project that needs doing? Why, why is that something that artists and, uh, and art historians and environmentalists are now interested in? Why is that important? 
Really good question. I think there are a couple of ways to answer it. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think this project of denaturalizing nature and denaturalizing landscape are connected. And they, in a way, describe my sort of my long term project from being a ranger all the way through to today. Mm -hmm. I think that because nature and landscape are sort of categories or concepts that get deployed in order to naturalize things, to make things seem inevitable, to cover things up in some sense, to whitewash in some sense, to, um, to repress questions. Um, that it's important to look at the ways that you know these categories get constructed over time and the way that they also you know that landscapes both like in a physical sense can be used to conceal but concepts of landscape mm -hmm. can conceal so many things so mm -hmm. the kind of the idea of the American West as a kind of frontier an empty frontier if we think about all of the repercussions and the erasures that are tied to that myth that mythology that's been so powerful in the history of the United States. Um, and, and one reason I think artists and a kind of experimental aesthetic workers, you could say, I, I, I like to, uh, in my own sort of view, art is a very kind of broad category mm -hmm. um, that involves kind of experimentation. Um, but I think one thing that artists tend to be very good at and the work I'm very drawn to is work that's helping to sensitize us to um, complexity and to kind of make things that are familiar less familiar as a way of kind of prompting questions, making us uncomfortable, um, raising sensitivities. So yeah, I think a lot of the work in the book is, again, it's not, it doesn't run across all of them, but a lot of the projects or the artists are um, sort of dealing with this issue, issues of erasure and invisibility, mm -hmm. and sort of um, figuring out ways to kind of make legible or make visible or sort of raise to the surface things that are kind of hidden or repressed. Um, and just one other, you know, example of a kind of um, a case in which landscape is kind of physically used to cover mm -hmm. a past. Mm -hmm. Um, in the U.S. context, and there's a, there is a really wonderful entry in the book by Shiloh Krupar, who's a geographer, who also has done a lot of performative work herself, kind of experimental work. She created a fictitious kind of land management agency. Mm. But she's done a lot of work on military to wildlife conversion sites. Mm -hmm, so old mm -hmm. kind of federal lands, also public lands, not that far off from the National Park Service, different kinds of pieces of land mm -hmm. that are very toxic and that have been remade into wildlife refuges. And she looks at the kind of fabrication of these sites and the kind of process of cleansing and remaking and kind of erasure that goes on to recraft the story of a place that um, covers up all sorts of kinds of um, violent histories to humans and non-humans both. So, um, and, a, and another example which, you know, would be actually an interesting topic for a, a class. I haven't thought about teaching on this before. Is the issue of rewilding, mm -hmm. and there's a lot been a lot of debate about rewilding, both its kind of potential as a way to bring back nature or to kind of heal damaged landscapes. But there's been also, you know, there have been kind of scholars and activists who've also said, but you know, to to have a landscape of war, for instance, or of environmental kind of contamination, just be rewilded is also to mask something that maybe we need to not forget. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in these kinds of questions. I found very interesting in the essay, in the introduction, the little, uh, the paragraph about the, that uh, one of the ways we understand landscape is based on a mistaken etymology. Mm -hmm. That is to say mm -hmm. that, well, why don't you explain that? Yeah, so in art history for I don't, I actually don't know how long, but for quite some time, the notion of landscape has been tied to this idea of the view, so that it's about a kind of composition of landscape tied to the painterly tradition that kind of emerged Renaissance, you know, that, that this idea of kind of landscape is always, in a, it's always kind of, um, it's different than land mm -hmm. because it's tied to kind of our visual representation of land. Um, and then etymolog etymologically, Tim Ingold kind of um, pointed out in an essay that really grabbed my attention that if we actually look back to this kind of piece of scape, it, it, it's tied in fact, not 
well, it, or maybe it's tied to both, scope, vision, but also to shaping. So kind of physical interactions with land, to labor, to marking the land. And so um, then these kind of very material questions about material histories of landscape come into play. And we sort of move a little bit away in some cases from just a, a kind of pure, purely aesthetic considerations. Mm -hmm. And I think it, um, that shift also helps open on to more kind of explicitly political questions, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. So on that, tell us a little bit about the visual culture of climate change. What, what, what's, what's happening in the visual culture of climate change now? Well, I'm about to start a class which I'm both excited about and admittedly a little terrified about because mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a really challenging class to hmm. teach. Um, and I, I've not seen kind of examples of other people teaching this class yet. Um, I'm always curious to kind of look at various syllabi when I'm developing my own. I put a lot of time into kind of constructing my classes. But um, this is a little bit, there's there have been a couple of books on the topic, but it's a pretty new kind of terrain. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, would, I think it's safe to say that climate change, and I've done a little bit of writing about this, climate change has largely been framed through a few different kinds of, um, you could say regimes, that's sort of a fancy word, but there are sort of different types of representation of climate change, and some that we're all very familiar with, um, which are the most common. One is um, tech, tech, uh, technical images, um, satellite images, various other graphs, like if we think about the Inconvenient Truth mm -hmm. film, which we will watch in my class, and the kind of famous hockey stick um, graph that Al Gore or maybe it's not a hockey stick, the one that goes way up yeah. and, you know, we all remember this scene of the film. So, um, you know, kind of the data sets um, and um, satellite images. One interesting thing is that, um, you know, in many ways it's impossible to image climate change. It sort of exceeds and um, eludes representation, partly because it is so dispersed and it happens in so many ways, some of which are picturable and some of which are not picturable. Mm -hmm. So I think the story of climate change has largely been collapsed um, into kind of scientific images which have a lot of information packed in them and they're very important for communication um, and for kind of communicating research and for um, making a case that climate change is real. Um, but there are a lot of things they leave out, of course. I mean, it's sort of condensation that becomes a very particular kind of representation um, that also bespeaks the kind of central role that science has played in articulating climate change um, and economy as well, you could say. Um, another kind of commonplace type of representation would be the kind of science fiction apocalyptic film. Mm -hmm. Um, going even back to the 50s, there were kind of climate-related cli-fi films. So that's a different kind of genre. And then we see a lot of polar bears on icebergs and these kinds of, um, these images of pathos, but they're often like far away and they're not representing people mm -hmm. and they're not representing things that are kind of every day. Mm -hmm. So um, many of all of the types of images I've mentioned already, um, they often can be very spectacular. So um, I'm interested in thinking about what are um, representations of climate change that are less spectacular, mm -hmm. that are um, that also need to be part of the story to kind of articulate the um, incredible complexity of climate change, to also capture kind of the asymmetrical situation of people's exposure to and vulnerability to climate change. What kind of images get it at those sorts of really hard kind of social aspects mm -hmm. of, of climate change. How do we represent extinction tied to climate change? What, what, what does that look like? And so I'm gonna teach a lecture class this spring, which will parallel a, a large scale book project I'm, I'm working on, which is a, one of the Rutledge companion handbooks, which will mm -hmm. be on art, visual culture, and climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm co-editing that with TJ Demos, who's a very prominent art historian. Uh, at UC Santa Cruz, who's worked a lot on art and environment, and Shubankar Banerjee, who's a very prominent climate activist um, and photographer. He's an artist as well. And so we're, you know, 
kind of deep into that project right now, and so the class, I'm hoping that they sort of really dovetail and help one another. Mm. Um, but I, I, in that class, we'll look at work by artists dealing with climate change. A lot of artists are working on climate mm -hmm. change, but I also really wanna look at popular cultures of climate change, so the other things I've sort of mentioned, and look at scientific imagery. How can we become more astute visual readers of this kind of enormous challenge that we're facing that has so many faces and so many dimensions. How can we think about it in ways that get closer to matching the complexity of the kind of condition itself? Mm -hmm. You've made clear, I think, mm -hmm. that your one of your modes is collaboration. You do mm -hmm. a lot of collaborating, and you've True. talked about collaborating with artists, and that you, in fact, make your own kind of uh, artworks. Tell us about the World of Matter project. Mm -hmm. What is that? So that is an art research media platform, you could call it. Um, that is, a, a, it's a project that is largely sort of, there's not, we're not really producing new work together. Many, you know, as most collectives are, they sort of take on a life and they have a momentum and people kind of do work together and then people move on. I'm still in communication with most all of those people um, and we're still doing work that's kind of related to what we were doing there. But it was very active from about 2011 to 2000, maybe 15, 16. And actually, we had a large exhibition at University of Minnesota at the Nash Gallery in 2017. And I co-organized a large uh, conference there and a two-day field excursion there dealing with um, kind of ways that materialities, material in the ground, get mobilized. So that exhibition, that particular iteration, so the project itself is kind of an, um, kind of an artistic research project that mm -hmm. was composed of roughly eight core kind of participants for several years, um, mostly artists, one photojournalist, and a couple of us who are more coming from theory that were interested in looking at primary materials, um, kind of cotton, gold, water, fish, and doing research on these primary materials in a very global context, in fact. I'm not meaning everyone looked at the whole globe, but like mm -hmm. these practitioners were doing kind of long-term intensive field work and multi-year projects, research projects, to produce artworks about like a very specific topic in often kind of remote um, contexts or very kind of you know intense contexts. Places like the Amazon, where we know now there's like tremendous kind of violence happening against indigenous people in the jungle as kind of gold companies are moving in. These kinds of contexts are the one these, these collaborators of mine were working in. And um, so the idea was to form a kind of group where we would come together biannually for these very like l intensive five, six day meetings, often with a public event attached to them, and really develop these works in relation to one another, building towards a multimedia web platform, which is still easily found online. There's a lot of visual material and textual material there. And so it was about, again, like um, doing a very um, kind of field-based, research-based practice on these you know, kind of sites of conflict and these kinds of materials that are so central to kind of making the world work and really getting at kind of how imbricated they are in kind of a range of systems. So, yeah, it's a little bit, of, It's even though I've been part of the project really from the inception almost, it's, it's a difficult project to kind of describe quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken the form of two books, I think something like five exhibitions by now in several like countries um, and a number of other publications and symposia and I, and actually the book from the this last conference at University of Minnesota there's a very small book but I'm very proud of it that's coming out any day now that mm -hmm. I co-edited with two collaborators from well one is um, they're not from World of Matter they were based in Minnesota that'll be called Viscosity Mobilizing Materialities. Mm. So in that context, we invited four people who spoke at the conference to give contributions. It's gonna be like a thin volume, but kind of a, an output from that particular iteration of World of Matter. And mm. so, yeah, it's like the, the Los Angeles Urban Rangers, this other kind of art collective that I've been involved with for a long time. Much of my kind of community has kind of emerged out of these collaborations. and you know, just, um, they've been incredibly crucial to my trajectory. So you just mentioned the uh, Los Angeles Urban Rangers. Mm -hmm. You're a co-founder of that uh, art collective. What is that? 
It's a performative site-based kind of interpretive group that um, dresses up as rangers and um, reads urban contexts sort of against their grain by playing around with shifting the frame of like the urban and the natural and kind of getting at the kind of entanglements of the natural and the cultural that are the reality. Um, but that which the kind of um, that binary that it tends to still you know, have so much power of like, there's the city and there's the country, mm -hmm. or there's the urban and the natural. So we wanted to really like um, play with that and um, and kind of turn it upside down and mix it around. And so we were most active in LA from about 2004 to 2010. We still have produced some new projects since then, but the four core people in that group, lived, we all lived in LA kind of for most of that period. And now we've sort of dispersed. But um, we produced a lot of campfire programs, guided hikes, um, kind of site-specific programming in and around the city. And the project that sort of garnered the most interest and attention for us and is sort of our watershed project was on Malibu, Mal the privatization of Malibu's beaches. Mm -hmm. Or in fact, the situation of the Malibu beaches being legally public up to a certain point, but being um, made inaccessible by various forms of kind of um, trickery <laughs> and lack of information about accessibility. So the project was really aimed at kind of helping people identify, find, and access the public lands that are theirs in a city where there's a real dearth of public space, particularly for certain classes. So we dressed up as rangers and did these Malibu public beach safaris and we developed a map. We worked with the California Coastal Commission to kind of translate their research which was very good but almost illegible like impossible to kind of a access and understand how to mm -hmm. read it into a very accessible kind of map that looks exactly like a national park service map so our visual you know materials really mimic very directly national park service kind of literature so the black band white helvetica font you know looks like a park ranger guide um, but we created maps that really helped show you where are the access points, how do you get to these public beaches once you're on the beach, how do you tell where's the kind of public and private land, and um, had those translated into Spanish eventually, had them put on the city buses along the Malibu beach line. So um, yeah, that was a, an exciting project to be part of, to say the least. And you say it's still happening, sort of? The, we, I don't think we've done any Malibu tours for a while, but the, the guide is still accessible and freely downloadable from our website. And we still do get invitations sometimes to do Malibu tours. Um, the person who whose research really that project evolved out of was the environmental historian Jenny Price, who you know has now been a very like dear and close friend of mine and collaborator for many years. She had done all of this work kind of more as a journalist. She was sort of journalistically working on this issue. And we thought, this is such good material. Like, there's really potential to convert this into a kind of um, set of kind of, you know, tours or kind of an LA Urban Ranger project. And so, yeah, so um, thanks to Jenny for all of her hard work on the Malibu um, situation that like led to the evolution of that project. Well, um Emily, thank you so much for taking the time <laughs> to speak with us today. It's been a really interesting conversation. I I've wish really we could go it. longer. Yeah, thank well, you, so you know, it's, it's been a total <laughs> pleasure. I've been speaking with Emily Eliza Scott, Assistant Professor of Art History and Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.